Joining us today is Natty Shalom, the founder and CTO of Gigaspaces. He's here today to talk to us about development and data in the cloud. How are you doing today, Natty? I'm fine. I'm very good. Well, uh, let's get right into it. Uh, your company does a lot of uh, addressing issues in the cloud, but let me let me ask you, how is the current application development environment changing when we ha when we're dealing with things like cloud? or maybe a virtualization and private cloud inside the data center? Uh, that's a very good question, actually. It's a, a fairly, I would say, popular topic these days. Uh, I think that the main change is that the line between operation and application development is kind of becoming blur, and the uh, application developer needs to worry more about things that uh, were previously just the responsibility of the operation, like how the application behaves in production, and uh, kind of code that into their application. Uh, so on one hand, the application developers need to be much, much more operational savvy uh, than they used to be in, uh, before. Uh, on the operational side, I would say that they need to provide high level of SLA to the organization rather than dealing with the uh, you know, scripting and low level details. They need to you know, kind of be measured by uh, real application SLA. So from a development perspective, what I'm seeing is that a lot of the development framework are starting to add uh, a lot of the APIs and uh, and coding that will enable the application to get a feedback from the system, from the production system, how the application behave and react to that. And things like auto scaling, for example, is a classic example for that. In order to be able to auto scale, you need to be able to see that there is a load. Based on the load, you need to instantiate more instances and things on that line. Right. So let, let's talk about that in detail a little bit because um, in, in, you know, in the older models, you just deploy your code. The code would perform in a certain way. You'd understand how that performance was. And then once you reached a level where you felt like, okay, the server is, is under load, the application is under load, uh, you'd figure out a way to maybe add another server. Uh, that'd be your system administrator's responsibility. Uh, that could take a few weeks. Uh, and uh, you'd figure out how to um, address that load across multiple servers sort of in an extended time frame. Uh, but with uh, cloud computing or virtualization, uh, you have the ability to go ahead and bring servers online right away and pull them back. How do you uh, tell us about that ability to instantiate new instances and support scaling out applications from the application itself? Yeah, so I think that the main thing, exactly as you said, is that uh, now we have an API to do a lot of those manual work, uh, and the API is becoming something that is uh, becoming a very uh, important value for even the cloud provider themselves. So basically, they're one of the main selling points for Amazon is their EC2 API and their S3 API and all their APIs that they can offer to do a lot of those things. So that that is a big enabler. Because now that I have an API, that means that on the application, I can actually interact with the machine, not manually, but programmatically. Uh, so basically, the program will look like, oh, I see that there is a, a load in the system, and I get that event either from my application, somewhere in uh, my application, or some external service that can call on that. And basically, I have the libraries of Amazon, whoever uh, data center that I'm interacting with, you know, VMware could be, or it could be an Amazon API, it could be a GoGrid API, or whichever data center that I'm interacting with, then all I need to do is just spawn a machine when I see that. Now that's, I would say, the basics of that. In most cases, that's not enough because what you'll need to do is also make the application be aware that there is a new machine and somehow rebalance itself to that. And that's where things become a little bit more tricky. So I, I think the, uh, the common maybe misconception at a high level from the cloud is that the cloud just has unlimited resources which is sort of the case, I mean, especially compared to the typical data center model. But you still have to manage those resources, and you have to bring them online and offline as you see fit, right? Yes. It's, uh, it's not, I think that it even goes further than that. Even if I uh, do need to be bring them up or down, uh, there are three questions that I usually ask uh, when I uh, kind of interact with those type of questions. Uh, what question, what will happen to the application when you add another instance? And usually the answer is, if I have an existing application, nothing will happen. Because it even know, wouldn't even know that there is an image. And the third question, or the second question, would be, okay, assuming that you even know that there is an image, and you somehow make the application aware of that, 
how would the application behave in terms of throughput performance, and which part of the application would you move to that new machine? So these are the type of questions that I think are the new challenges that we need to kind of address, and, and that's what I think is the current missing piece. Uh, in that environment. All right, so let's switch uh, gears a little bit and talk about data because uh, there's lots of big data sets when we talk about cloud and these big applications. Um, we've seen certain programs like uh, database systems like MySQL being used in very large implementations. Uh, how are, are these applications able to use a database like MySQL? Yeah, I think a good example is what Amazon has done, uh, which is called RDS, Relational Database as a Service. Uh, I think that the basic uh, thing is how to basically automate the current type of deployment that people are using, and that's one piece. Now, on the other hand, if you look at Microsoft, Microsoft is using an SQL Azure, a slightly different approach, which is not just in a way to automate a single instance of a database, but a way to uh, automate a cluster of the databases. And that's kind of uh, another approach. And uh, they're using some sort of load balancing in front of that. And to my to a degree, I think that's a more advanced approach to do things. Google, on the other hand, with uh, Google App Engine, uh, took their um, big table and actually took a very different approach to the uh, MySQL and to the Azure approach, to the Microsoft approach, and basically said uh, uh, that they can actually uh, solve that problem by taking a non SQL database which is born to scale and wrap it with SQL facade so that you could still access it as if it was SQL. And that's, by the way, the same kind of approach that we've taken with Gigaspaces, but unlike uh, Google, uh, what we've done is that our big table is in memory. So we also offering not just the scaling, but the performance and latency. Wow. Okay. Well, let me, let me ask you, since you're in the space a lot, what are the, some of the ways applications can really take advantage of the cloud? Not just moving an application into the cloud uh, for the sake of, of, of saving on a server, but actually take advantage of that cloud. Yeah, so I think the, there is a, uh, several use cases. That I think that the most uh, interesting one uh, right now is coming from analytics, where you have a, a lot of burst type of behavior where you can... Uh, the behavior tends to be varying in terms of load between uh, peaks and valleys. Uh, in that case, uh, trying to build uh, the system locally would probably cost you uh, too much in many ways. So the cost uh, difference is going to be enough of a factor that will uh, be a motivation to do things seriously in the cloud. And a, a company that uh, I spoke to recently is one of our customers, which is named Primatix, and they actually took um, a risk analysis application multi-analysis application and, and brought it to the cloud and now they're running on top of uh, Gigaspace and EC2, the Amazon EC2. And in that case, the rationale was that they wanted to take that heavy task of calculation and a lot of data processing and by doing it in an on-demand basis per request, per customers, uh, they can actually offer a very large-scale software as a service type of solution for that. Okay. Uh, but I think all those type of analytics would be a very good candidate. Obviously, software as a service type of application would be another category of, uh, of application that would move to the cloud. Uh, but some of them would probably see less of an advantage of that because they more tend to be more static in terms of behavior. So in that regard, we'll probably see the one that has a heavy load uh, behavior per user uh, adopting cloud uh, sooner than others. Now, there's a uh, uh, talk about the hybrid model of being inside and outside, what services are going to be the, in the cloud, what are still going to be in the data center. Uh, but some people see us move, moving more towards utility computing and more towards the cloud. Um, how should IT really approach the new issues of the cloud? I mean, we've got issues now uh, where we're going to deal with things like latency and, and transforming our applications uh, to be able to work with some of the new challenges um, that have classically we haven't had to deal with. Uh, what, what should the approach be? Yeah, so, so I think that the first approach would be to, because uh, in many cases the data center itself is not really running locally in your office. It's actually running somewhere. Uh, one approach is uh, the physical level, first of all, pick the cloud provider that is uh, relatively adjacent to your own data center so that the latency issue wouldn't be that much of an issue that I would say uh, would be number one. And, and then uh, you could have that kind of data center split into two parts. One of them is your local on-premise fixed type of resources, 
and something on demand that happens to be a least resource, but uh, you wouldn't feel too much of a latency difference between the two, but the SLA would be different and the cost would be different. So that's, uh, I think, one approach to that. The other approach is to use uh, the same thing that any, data, any large organization uses today when it's running on multi-data center type of uh, environment. And a lot of the large organizations already have multi-data center, you know, like New York, London, and Tokyo kind of uh, set up. And in that case, they feel the same latency issues that they would feel with cloud. So in that regard, cloud is no different. And the way they solve it in this multi-data center is by doing replication, caching, and all those sort of things. Mm. So uh, we're, we're actually being used in, in many ways to populate data between multiple data centers. And in that case, uh, the cloud would be just one private case of those data centers. Okay. All right, well, uh, it looks like we're almost out of time, so why don't you tell us a little bit more about Gigaspaces? Yeah, I think that in short, Gigaspaces, uh, what we've been trying to do over the years is do two things. One of them is solve the complex problems of how you can run in this food environment, and the second thing, and that's pretty much the thing that we're doing in the past few years, make it simple as if, it, as if you're running on a single machine. Uh, so that's kind of the, uh, the two main areas at the high level. The second thing that we're doing is we're taking advantage of the new hardware capabilities, namely memory multi-core network, and trying to build a solution that, unlike a lot of the databases and other technologies, is fully optimized for those resources and will take full advantage of them. So you could store terabytes of data in memory, and it could be running very efficiently on multi-core, as well as the dishes type of system. Wow, okay. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Eric. All right. Uh, uh, joining us today again was Natty Shalom, uh, CTO of Gigaspaces. You can find more information at gigaspaces.com. I also recommend their blog, by the way, good stuff. And you can find the links at our website, cstechcast.com.